We are live with the 99th episode, if you count many episodes, which I do, the 99th episode of Hollywood Kitchen. And today we're going to talk about the incredible producer, director, actress, Ida Lupino. I've got Donna Hill joining me from San Francisco. She's an author, a film historian, and a darn good cook. And I know this because I have eaten at her home in San Francisco several times. And so we're going to make a Lipino's lemon mousse, and we're going to do that. And then we'll have a pre-recorded interview that I shot earlier this week with um, author and historian Mark Vieira, who just wrote a new book, Warner Brothers at 100. So we're going to um, show that interview later. And Donna, thank you so much for joining me. Well, thank you for having me. And as you know, you're always welcome anytime you're in San Francisco to come here. Yeah, I'm going to be taking you up on that in July, so stay tuned. Okay. So I want to talk about this recipe that we're going to make, and getting ready for this episode, it occurred to me this is the fourth mousse I have done on Hollywood Kitchen, because you and I did the Agnes Ayers mousse last summer, and then Danny and I did the Betty Davis cranberry mousse for Thanksgiving, and then way, way back, I did an Anne Devorah coffee mousse with Christina Rice. So this is mousse number four. And you're telling me, Donna, this is the best of all mousses. So. Well, I really liked it a lot. I love lemon desserts. Um, so, you know, lemon meringue pie, anything like that, I'm a sucker for. And looking at this recipe, you know, unlike about 95% of the, the Hollywood recipes, this looked really doable and didn't look, you know, gross, like some recipes can be, the ones, you know, mainly ones that you've never cooked and you probably would never want to cook. Um, and all I did was when I made mine, I tweaked it just a little bit because when I read the recipe as a person who does like to cook, um, you know, one, I don't have a double boiler and you don't need it for the first part. Uh, but two, the second, the second part, which was add the rest of the sugar, which was a lot of sugar, and the egg yolks to the hot milk mixture, it was like, and cook for one minute. It's like, no, that is not right. Um, so what I did was, you know, did the first part, which was the milk and the cornstarch and a bit, bit of sugar, but I added the bulk of the rest of the sugar as well. So that would melt and cook. And then secondly, I took, you know, a couple of tablespoons of sugar and the egg yolks, and I beat them with a wire whip with my mixer. So it, you know, immediately fluffed up. Then, you take the hot milk mixture a little bit at a time as you would with a custard, temper the eggs, then you can dump it all back in and add the lemon juice and it's perfect. Can you walk me through this, Donna? Sure. Excellent. I wanna say, by the way, this recipe came from one of my favorite cookbooks. This cookbook is called Favorite Recipes of the Famous Movie Stars. It is from 1934. And this is kind of one of the gems in my cookbook collection. It's got beautiful Art Deco graphics. It's got a portrait of the star. It's got a biography of the star. It's really beautifully done. And it's even got art or images of the star's faces on the front, the back. It's looks just, really nice. I may have to try and find this one. Yeah, I think I got a lot of these on eBay or Etsy. So um, yeah, hopefully this one will turn up again. But I, I saw this recipe and... Jenny from Silver Spring Suppers in England, she had nothing but good things to say about this recipe too. So it seemed to be confirmed by several people that this was a good yeah. one. Yeah, no, I mean, the base recipe is really good. Um, just me as a, you know, modern cook, not 1934. One, typically we don't have double boilers. And two, egg safety, really need to cook the egg a little bit longer and take a little care so that you don't end up with scrambled egg in your dish rather than a nice pudding or custard. When I did um, the Douglas Fairbanks lemon pie with our friend and colleague, Tracy Gossel, I had so many problems with that that I think I made like four lemon pies because several times I would just have lemon with scrambled eggs floating in it. And it took me so long to master that one. Mm -hmm. And I'm still not convinced I was all the way there. Well, worst case, even if your eggs do scramble, that's what strainers are for you just push it through a sieve and it takes all the you know lumpy bits out okay so you want to start okay let's get started here uh let's see all right i've got my uh i don't have a double boiler either i did try to make one my own homemade one and put a bowl on top of a pan in the water mm -hmm. it didn't work i just kind of gave up and just you know yeah 
as long as you cook it on, you know, medium low to start while it starts to thicken, it's fine. So, you know, put, put some sugar and your cornstarch in. How much sugar uh, should I start out with? It says four tablespoons on the recipe. You can start with that and you can add more sugar once you put the milk in. Um, okay. So I'll start with four tablespoons of sugar. So one. There's a lot of sugar. Yeah, which is why I cut the sugar because I prefer a lemon dessert more on the tart side than the sweet. Okay, two, two tablespoons of cornstarch go in. That right here. Okay. And if you got a little whisk, whisk them together. Okay. Do. Because the whole point of putting the sugar and the cornstarch together is to make sure that the cornstarch doesn't clump when you add the liquid. Ah, okay. We don't like clumping around here, so. No. I have my whisk. I'm gonna whisk the cornstarch with the sugar together so they are very commingled. I'm kind of generating a little smoke here for some reason. Yeah, it's the cornstarch. Okay. Okay, now add the milk and turn yeah. the heat on. Okay. I always have to remember I'm using my little hot plate for the purposes of the show, and it does take a few minutes to kind of uh, get warmed up here. So I'm going to start with uh, stirring this together. Yeah, exactly. Chicken. And of course, I use fresh lemons. I try to always use fresh fruit and not frozen or artificial when I, I cook. Oh, yeah. So. Okay. Yeah, I was, I was lucky because um, a neighbor friend of mine had come into a, a giant bag of Meyer lemons. So she gifted me half a bag. So I juiced them all and had, you know, I freeze part of it and the rest was in the fridge. Excellent, excellent. Okay, while this is heating up, how long does it usually take for this to thicken, by the way? Um, less than five minutes usually, depending on how hot the stove is. If you've got it on, you know, medium heat, um, it, it's not gonna take long, but you will need to keep stirring it and uh, use when, once it starts to thicken, use your um, spatula. That way it doesn't stick to the bottom. Mm. And then as you, as you see that it's thick, then you can take it off the heat. Okay. So cool. what's your favorite Ida Lupino movie? Oh gosh, that's a tough one. Um, I love Roadhouse because that is just such a fun noir. And mm -hmm. one year they showed that as the closing night movie for Noir City and it just like brought the house down. Mm -hmm. So I love that one. And granted, this the the movie Outrage is not a movie that you necessarily love, but you admire because it's a brutal topic. But yeah. I saw a print of that at the UCLA Film Archive, and it's a, a film, of course, I had directed, and it's about a young woman who is brutally raped and trying to recover. Yeah, Molly Powers. It just tore my guts out, and it was such a brave film for her to make at a time when people were not talking about that topic. They certainly weren't making films about it, and it's I, it's pretty rare, I think. I, I don't I think it's even like commercially available that I'm aware of, and uh, so I'm really glad I, I got to see that in several of her films on the big screen. Yeah, it's the best way to see them. What's your favorite Ida Lupino? Well, I mean, I love her as an actress when she was at Warner Brothers. I mean, The Sea Wolf is great. Um, they Drive By Night because that's just such a crazy performance and she's wonderful in it. Um, she's and The Hard Way is also excellent. As a director, while I love her film noir classics and you know the gritty films, I am a sucker for The Trouble with Angels just because it is such a marvelous film. Uh, sadly, her last directorial effort. Um, and I can't remember the title of it, but I also love her Twilight Zone episode. And I think she, I think she was on an Outer Limits or maybe it was an Alfred Hitchcock, I can't remember. I think it was an Alfred um, Hitchcock. And I think she was the only woman to ever direct a Twilight Zone episode, if mm -hmm. I'm not mistaken. And she acted in one and directed one. Yeah. I believe. And she was just such a trailblazer in terms of, I think she was only the second woman ever admitted to the DGA, the Directors Guild of America, besides uh, Dorothy Arzner. Mm -hmm. So she truly was a, an incredible pioneer, of course. That she was. 
Okay, this is starting to heat up, but it's not yet thickening. So yeah, it has to come uh, close to a boil to activate the cornstarch. Ah, so. good to know. You know, I I've always liked talking to you about these vintage recipes because, as someone who is just learning to cook and no less learning with vintage recipes, there are so many little details and little steps they don't talk about. And for me, I kind of need a very explicit explanation of things or else I'm just going to. Yeah, that that's what makes cooking these very difficult because they're always very vague about the steps. And they're also, you know, vague saying bake at a moderate heat, which, of course, in 1930s speak, you know, they didn't have temperature gauges on an oven like we do in the modern times. So and I, I don't think. Uh, Oven thermometers were fairly common either. No, it's starting to thicken. Okay, hooray. Okay. I'm okay, sorry. now you can stir it with your um, okay. spatula just to make sure there's nothing stuck to the bottom. And if it is thick, then take it off the heat. Okay, okay, taking it off the heat. Okay. okay. Have you got a pot holder or something to, or just leave that there? Because now you're going to work on your um, egg yolks. Okay, now I'm turning the heat off because it's very thick now. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So now what will I do with egg yolks? Okay, now what you're going to do with the egg, oh, you know what? We forgot to put the rest of the sugar in. Okay, um, I'm not going to use all of this. So what would yeah. you think about maybe? Well, how much did you put in? About a half a I cup? Put four uh, tablespoons in at the outside. Okay, uh, put in about half of what you've got in your bowl there. Okay. And stir it around. Okay. And hopefully that's going to dissolve just on... Uh, uh, with the residu residual heat. Yes, that is okay. Happening. So next, what you're going to do is with your egg yolks, and you're going to add some sugar to that, just a couple of tablespoons, you know. Okay. Now, have you got a hand mixer by any chance? You know, I do. Here's the problem. It makes a lot of noise, which trying to do this on Zoom kind of makes that process a little more. <laughs> All right. Well, the, it would speed things up dramatically if you used it, but not if you're not. No, no worries. You um, just use your whisk and okay. whisk the eggs and the sugar together, and do it until the egg start. The egg yolks start to lighten in color a little bit. This may take okay. a minute or two. All right. Yeah, I really wish they had silent mixers that didn't make any noise. <laughs> that would totally help me with this show. Well, I have to say, when I made this yesterday, um, because I did use my um, hand mixer with the whip attachment, it literally made the preparation for this about five minutes, which I loved. It was like, yay, this is so quick. Yay, that's good to know. So when the egg yolks have started to lighten in color a little bit, what you're going to do is add a little bit of the hot milk mixture into okay. the eggs and keep whisking, but only do a tiny bit of the, bit. the okay. hot mixture because what you're doing is bringing the eggs to temperature, but okay. you don't want to cook them. That's okay. the whole reason for this. Okay, well, I'm gonna do this. And while I'm doing this, we'll talk about Ida Lupino more. Okay. Um, of course, she came from a family of theatrical performers. So that was like in her blood day one. Her dad was the great performer, Stanley Lupino. And she came to Hollywood. Her uncle was Lupino Lane. Yes, yes. And she came to Hollywood, of course, when the, in the 30s. And I think she was very frustrated at Paramount because they kind of were putting her in B-movies and stuff that she didn't feel was, was worthy of her talent. And then she signed with Warner Brothers, where I think she also felt very constrained as I talk about too with Mark Vieira, I always hate it when she's referred to as the poor man's Betty Davis. I feel like that's so insulting. It's like, I don't know if she herself came up with that or if that was just sort of given to her that label. But, well, you know, at that time, this for an upcoming star, this was the nature of the beast. I mean, Betty was the queen of the studio. That is true. You know, <laughs> by 1937, 38, uh, when Kay Francis's career was winding down because the Warners wanted to get rid of her. Um, you know, Olivia de Havilland went through this and Sheridan went through it as well. I mean, everybody, you know, Jane Wyman was in, you know, comedies and, um, B-movie series like Brother Rat for years. 
before you know making Johnny Belinda in 1948. Um, so I think that was just the nature of the beast. That's how everyone was brought up to be a bigger star or to you know rise through the ranks. I mean, and this is not unique of Warner Brothers. Oh no, definitely. Um, but I mean, with my personal preferences, I mean, Warner Brothers is my favorite studio. How is that looking? Is it is it, it nice and smooth? Good. Yeah, it's very okay. nice and smooth. I'm just okay. If it's, nice and smooth, if it's nice and smooth, then you can. What you can do is just add all of that back into the hot milk mixture. Okay. And put in your lemon juice. Okay, we're going to add the egg and sugar mixture back to the hot mixture here. Yep. And. And then add add the lemon juice and um, put it back on the heat for just a minute or two. The lemon yeah. juice. Yeah, and you can you can whisk that all together. You don't necessarily need to use the spatula. It'll probably mix better. Mix, excuse me, mix better with the uh, whisk. Okay. And you so said to turn the heat back on as well. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I just want to make sure that everything's cooked. Okay. And Including the sugar that I forgot to tell you to add sooner than we did. Making a mess here, but okay. So, all right, we're gonna turn on the heat, probably on low right now to mix this yeah. all together. And you know, when I posted that I was gonna do this episode, Christopher Reardon, who is an older gentleman who follows me online, he's very sweet. I met him through the Rudolph Valentino Memorial Service events, and he's had an incredible life. And he commented, she was the best director I ever had. And I wrote him and I was like, please, please be on the Hollywood Kitchen and talk about being directed by Ida Lupino. And he said he wasn't available, that we, but we would he'd be happy to chat about it in person with me at the Valentino Memorial Service this year. So Donna, we need to corner Christopher Reardon at the Valentino Memorial Service and ask him all about being personally directed by Ida Lupino. Okay, I'll be there. I nearly flipped my cookie when he said that. <laughs> That was really cool. Okay, is it all homogenized together? And um, it needs a little more time here, but and I was telling you earlier before we went on camera that I ran out of whipping cream and ran out of time, unfortunately, to go get some this morning. But you were telling me that um the recipe you can actually avoid the whipping cream and it makes a lemon pudding. Exactly. Just as this is, once it it thickens back up and it'll it'll thicken more once it you know goes in the fridge and cools. Um, it, it was delicious because I cut the recipe last night and split it in half and um, because I only, my freezer is jam-packed so I only had space for a small container of mousse um, so I you know put the rest in little custard cups and had one last night for dessert and it was delicious very oh. lemony very yummy good so, all right, I've got this on low heat. I'm uh, whisking it here for just a few more minutes and then hopefully shortly. And it, lo it looks like it's thick enough from what I can see. see. Yeah, it, lo it looks done. Okay, then I will take it off the heat. Now, let me ask you this. When I mid did my test batch this week, I added the whipping cream. I folded it in as best I could and then I mm -hmm. froze it. And then when I went to um, make some for my little final presentation here, which, by the way, I garnished it with a strawberry fresh mint from my garden, and it's in a 30s depression cup. And when I got it out of the freezer, it was frozen so solid. It was really kind of a lot of That's, I, I took mine out of the freezer this morning um, when I got up and just put it in the fridge. And it was soft enough for me to use a scoop. Let me go get mine. Okay. And I can go get a spoon really fast so I can eat some of this. I'm also in 1930s depression glass. Yes, this is a great mind and good life. This is called Boopy. Ooh. And uh, I've got it with raspberries. Excellent. So shall we taste it? Cheers. Cheers. It's very light. Mmm. 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 So good. Very lemony. This would be a great dessert for summer because right now we kind of have June gloom in LA. Same here. Frankly, Although it's not that hot. It's a little bit so, of sun today, but I've got the blinds closed in here. So 
Yeah, I tried to light this room with my little light kit, but even then there's only so much I can do. So, but I figure it's gonna get hot soon enough. When it does, I have a killer new dessert to make for the summer heat. Yeah, no, I'll def I will definitely make this again. Yeah, me too. Like there's some recipes mm -hmm. I've made that I think, okay, I'm never doing that one again. And then there's other things I make and I'm like, that's going in the rotation, you know? Yeah, no, when I look at some of these uh, cookbooks, I it's like, no, never, ever. I, I, I totally get the depression era cooking, but nah. And but I this, is, this is a keeper. And I don't like to waste food. So I try really hard to pick recipes that I am actually willing to eat, you know? Mm -hmm. I think that's important. And here's what, here's how nice and yellowy and creamy the final result looks here in the pan. So when yeah, we, um, if you pour it into one of your little depression cups, put it in mm -hmm. the fridge, it'll, it'll thicken more when it cools. Okay. And it's a nice bright yellow. It looks very creamy and silky. So that's cool. Mm -hmm. And it'll and be perfect to put in a tart shell if you want like a little mini lemon tart or just eat it on its own. It's a good idea too. Oh. Let's see if we have any questions from the audience. Because like I said, in a few minutes we'll be we'll be going to Mark Vieira interview. Let's see. And I'm doing the adage. Life is too short eating my dessert first because I haven't had lunch. I either actually. So Jack Fields is wishing us greetings from Warner Brothers. He's on the lot right now where Ida was. Well, greetings, Jack. Greetings, Jack. Greetings, everybody. Thank you guys so much for watching. Appreciate that. And uh, yeah, just people commenting that they're um, enjoying the hearing about this recipe. Uh, when I get a chance in the next day or two, I'll post the whole recipe online. So if people want to try it, they can. And I'll post Donna's personal notes because they really help me when I can get them. They are super helpful. Yeah, it's delish. Mm. You know, I wonder if people wanted to even add like alcohol to this, that they could sort of make it like a cocktail. Keep in, keep in mind, uh, yeah, I would say limoncello, but if, if you have a high alcohol content, the it won't freeze. Hmm. You know, last summer I made a mint julep bourbon ice cream for a friend. Mm -hmm. Just from the Golden Girls cookbook. And they said like, add the bourbon, the absolute last thing because of that reason because it kind of messes up the consistency otherwise yeah it's like but, using vodka you know putting a bottle of vodka in the freezer but it doesn't freeze it just gets really cold excellent well this was fun i enjoyed it yes i did too so donna um we both have other stuff we have to do today so uh we couldn't we couldn't talk longer but thank you so much for walking me through ida lapino's lemon mousse a great my day. pleasure Thank you to everybody watching Hollywood Kitchen. And if you stay tuned, I'm going to get up here in a second, share my screen, and show you the interview I did earlier this week with Mark Beer. Hi, and welcome to part two of the special episode on Ida Lapino for Hollywood Kitchen. I am here in the historic 1927 Granada building in downtown Los Angeles with author, photographer, and historian Mark Vieira, who just has the new book, on Warner Brothers 100 Years of Storytelling. And I know when a lot of Warner stars come up, names like Betty Davis, James Cadney, and Humphrey Bogart come to mind, but I wanted to talk today about Ida Lupino. So as we talk, Mark and I are going to be eating Ida Lupino's lemon mousse from a 1930s recipe. So Mark, tell me when was the first time that you ever encountered Ida Lupino's work? Well, the first meaningful time not the first time, <laughs> was in 1997 when I saw a film called Search for Beauty. 1934 Paramount film, same year as this recipe. And Ida Lupino was 16 years old. She was born in 1918. And the film was a, a pre-code film, very racy. And she played a, a, an Olympic swimmer who, along with Buster Crabbe, is recruited by two con men, James Gleason and Robert Armstrong, to act as fronts for a skin magazine and for a shady resort, uh, what would you call it, a 
kind of a spa. And um, so she and Buster Crab are the only decent people in the entire movie. Uh, everybody else is kind of a, a, a crook um, with a, you know, running a, a game. But it's, it's a very funny film, very artistically done by uh, the director, Earl C. Kenton, who also did Island of Lost Souls. But Search for Beauty is, is really a lots of fun and I recommend it highly. So it was Ida Lupino's first movie. And she had come from England where her family, the Lupinos and the Lanes were very well known theatrical entities. And uh, she came to try her, her luck, signed a contract with Paramount along with the people, the young people who had uh, entered contests all over the world, the Search for Beauty contest. And the winners came and appeared in the film. And one of them was Anne Sheridan, who was known at that time as Clara Lou Sheridan. Uh, she would have been teaching grammar school, I believe. And, you know, so she's in the same film with uh, Ida Lupino, James Gleason, Robert Armstrong, Gertrude Michael. And it's, uh, so I recommended this film very highly. So it's from the same year as this movie. And it is on, it is on a box set, right? It is on one of the pre-code box sets, I believe. It, that's true, and that's from Universal, but it also just came out from Kino Lorber. Oh, I love Kino Lorber. Uh, in a Blu-ray format. Very cool. So, I, from what I have read, I don't think life, Ida Lupino was very happy during her Paramount years. She felt that she wasn't getting the kind of dramatic roles that right. she wanted. Yeah, they keep, like, for example, she's in uh, Peter Ibbotson, and she has a small role in that. But uh, she was in also... Um, Anything Goes with Bing Crosby and Arthur Treacher and Charlie Ruggles. But yeah, she was frustrated. She wanted to play more, you know, meaty, dramatic roles. Worthy of her talent. So when her Paramount contract ended, I guess around 1941, she went to Warner Brothers and her first few films there really were notable for her performances. Uh, specifically, The Sea Wolf, uh, which was directed by Michael Curtiz. And then, uh, it may have been before, um, Raoul Walsh, uh, They Drive by Night. That's and a good one. With Humphrey Bogart, George Raft. And it was a, a semi-remake of Border Town. So just as Betty Davis had had a big courtroom scene in Border Town, a mad scene, uh, Ida Lupino had this scene in this film and she, she made the most of it. So people took notice of her. And so she was loaned out to 20th Century Fox for a film called uh, Moon Tide with Jean Gabin, who had been uh, visiting from France, having a romance with Marlene Dietrich at the same time. And uh, so, you know, Ida Lupino did a slow, steady climb. A couple of films that were important were The Man I Love with uh, Alan Alda and The Hard Way with Joan Leslie and Ida Lupino really, really shown in those films. And those, these were rediscovered uh, by Cinecon, as I recall, in the early 90s. Uh, I guess Leonard Maltin, Michael Schlesinger, Robert Burchard um, knew of the film's reputations and and got them at Cinecon and the, the, the word spread. So they eventually came out uh, on VHS and now on uh, the Warner Archive uh, made on demand DVDs. So we were talking before we went on camera about, I've always heard the phrase, the poor man's Betty Davis in relation to Ida Lupino. And I, I really don't like that phrase. I think it's kind of demeaning and to her. And you were saying that they kind of brought Ida in possibly to serve as sort of a threat to Betty Davis or to keep her in line. Yes, because at the time that, that uh, Ida Lupino came to Warner Brothers, Betty Davis was, was, was so strong that she was really directing her movies. Uh, she was the fifth Warner Brother. Yeah, she was, uh, well, the fourth at that point because there, okay. there were only three living. Um, but Davis was becoming uh, hard to control. Uh, and they were also having trouble with uh, Olivia de Havilland. So to bring someone like Ida Lupino in meant that, that there was, uh, you know, uh, well, if you, if you don't 
behave yourself. We're going to give her your your next film. And this was a, a standard practice at the time. They used James Craig to tr you know try and keep Clark Gable in line. Um, can you think of some other ones? Well, I know Peggy Shannon was always billed as Clara Bow's red-headed rival. And it seemed to me like there were a lot of actors that are even actors that were never hugely famous, but they were brought in as a sort of a look-alike of the bigger star. Yeah, let me think who else. Lucille Bremer, um, um, well, Angela Lansbury, you know, would be somebody that, that people would say, oh, she's going to be really uh, eat up Judy Garland, and, you know. Uh, but... Uh, you know, fortunately, these people mostly found distinguished careers of their own on their own terms, mm -hmm. especially Ida Lupino. Uh, one of her other good films is called uh, Deep Valley. It's 1947. That's John Nagolesco directed it. And she's in a film with Errol Flynn uh, that's what, Escape Me Never, right from 40. I'd have to double check 46, that one. I think but... it is, yeah. Um, but she, you know, she still was kind of just spinning her wheels. Uh, but then she found out that, you know, once she left Warner, she could direct movies and, you know, release them through United Artists. But she'd had to find, you know, a, a small production company, a, you know, a producer, and then they would release them through United Artists. But uh, she did The Bigamist, The Hitchhiker. Outrage. Outrage, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think, was that the first one, I think? I can't remember if that was the first one or not, but I saw a print of Outrage a few years ago at the UCLA Film and TV Archive, and it was stunning, and it was so brutal, because, she, of course, she made these social issue films that, yeah. you know, covered issues nobody was talking about at the time, so this, when I saw Outrage, I was just devastated by it. It's a, it's a film about a young woman who is brutally raped, and her journey to kind of recovering and reclaiming her life after that, and... Again, no one is making a film like this in the 1950s. No, so no. this was just groundbreaking and, stuff. Yeah, the majors, you know, the, the eight majors, which included United Artists, you know, were kind of nervous to do something like that. Plus, the production co administration would frown on it. But you know, they negotiated and, and uh, emphasized the, the the value of, of you know the socially redeeming value. Uh, so she was able to do those films. But um, then she married Howard Duff, and then he was. I think they, what was the film, was it, um, was she in The Big Knife? I'm so sorry, I can't remember off the top of my head. Yeah, yeah. Uh, another real, the Robert Aldrich. Uh, excellent, excellent film. And she's also in the Fritz Lang movie uh, with John Barrymore Jr. She she's a place of newspaper columnist. Uh, not beyond a reasonable doubt. Um, Help me, people. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please help us. But no, the point is that even at Warner Brothers, she found some roles that suited her. Then she went on to direct film. And then she went into directing television. And she directed a tremendous amount of television and proved to be really skilled at bringing episodes on time, on budget, and was really a very, very good director. But she was still acting, too. Now, there's you've seen this... Uh, Twilight Zone episode. Mm -hmm. the, six, the masks. The, oh, there's another one called the 16 millimeter shrine. And it is really a bravura performance. Excellent. And why do you think Ida is not as well remembered today? I say that, I mean, she's remembered by people like us, but by like the general public, um, why do you think she kind of is not as, not no. as well remembered? No one before 2005 is remembered by the general public. And I think we should address this issue. Uh, the words dated, uh, forgotten, really have no relevance anymore since the internet has, has come into play. Because, you know, like I mentioned, Gertrude Michael. Well, the, when I encountered Search for Beauty, it was because a man named Paul Mayenberg in San Francisco, a very generous soul, uh, had a collection of 16 millimeter films, and be, he really liked Gertrude Michael, so he had a number of her films. But now, if you go on the internet and you put in Gertrude Michael, you'll find lots of people who know she, who she is, who 
who would not have known in 97, uh, you know, collections or not, or, you know, well, for one thing, there's TCM, and there's also these, you know, Blu-ray releases and, and DVD releases, but the point is, the, the idea of dated or not known seems to be less and less a thing able to be pinned down you can't really say uh, you know if I say oh they did a book about Alexander Wolcott in 1973 why hasn't there been another one and somebody will say well he's no longer relevant but they know who he is because they look it up with it so you know it's, it's I, I don't know where, where is their top 40 of stars who, who are remembered and who aren't. I mean, it, it's just, uh, I think Ida Lupino, in fact, in fact, with all the emphasis on women filmmakers and pi women uh, pioneer filmmakers, mm -hmm. she has been in, in the limelight more than she had for her performances at Paramount, for example, in the last few years. And that's, you know, that's a great thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, it's, it's great that, that there's this kind of examination of a career as opposed to what was happening to make money for a writer in the 70s, like, you know, certain kinds of books, Charles Hyam or Kenneth Anger. Uh, it's, it's, <laughs> We're not going to talk about that. <laughs> yeah, but it's nice that, that now there's, there's a, an emphasis on achievements, uh, artistic merits, uh, you know, Personal uh, striving to you know to overcome the handicaps of the studio system that were you know set to keep people in place, mm -hmm. and you know, those things you know can be looked at now in a way they weren't before. Okay, fair enough. Fair enough. Now writing this book must have been a monumental task because you basically cover Warner Brothers from the silent era and the origins all the way up to modern day. So tell me how that process went and how hard was it to figure out what to include, what not to include, how many photos, how much real estate in the book did each era get? Well, uh, the book had to be done in a very short time because it took forever to get approval for it, for the company that was doing it. And uh, they wanted me to do it on my own. And I said, I'm not going to do it at all. And they insisted, and I said, well, I have to have a team then. So they gave me a team, a, a co-writer, and, and that guy dropped out. So I had help from, uh, instead of this person, I ended up having to write it, not just do the pictures. And um, I had help from Alexa Foreman in Atlanta. At, you know, she'd been with TCM since it began. In fact, months before it began. And Sloan DeForest, who's a very well-known writer, and, and excellent mm -hmm. books uh, she helped me also so they they helped me find the data that I needed to show what was happening not only in the industry but also uh, in American society and, and European society that affected what films were made how they were received um, and what trends began or didn't begin, you know, um, because there were a lot of false starts in the 70s. When the studio system changed, what we start seeing is uh, you have, you know, well, you know, in music you call it a one-hit wonder, but in movies, it, you know, you think, well, that person's going to go far. Like, I guess, Last Tango in Paris, uh, Maria Schneider didn't become the big star that she should have. Um, and Ken Russell's career uh, kind of blew up when he went a little too far with some of his films in terms of uh, shock value. And so, but it was, it's, you really can trace a great many careers through the Warner Brothers history. And that's, you know, well, for example, Clint Eastwood, who mm -hmm. just, just had a birthday. Um, to see him go from being, a, you know, an actor on TV to becoming a, a real filmmaker, a, you know, a, a member of the Warner Brothers filmmaking family. And it's, it's a wonderful story, and, and it's just it's great to trace his, his uh, career and his achievements and the chances he took and 
Some things worked, some things didn't, but the things that did work really worked, and he was, you know, rewarded for the, for those. But, um, you know, you, there's basically, the thing is in the studio system from when they started in 23 was one thing, and when Jack Warner shut down in 67 and left, took his $32 million payoff, <laughs> the studio system, he said, I can't take any more of this fighting with agents about deals and packages and it's it's no longer about making a movie it's about making deals and that's you know has persisted that situation from and that was 67 when he said that um, and he was the longest reigning studio chief right that's true yeah mm-hmm. Mayer had died uh, 10 years earlier Harry Cohn also the same year uh, 57 uh, Sam Goldwyn Pretty much retired, I guess around 60, 61. Um, William Fox didn't last, but Daryl Zanuck uh, went out, came back, went out, came back, uh, and that, that company was almost uh, sunk by the Cleopatra overruns. Anyway, the point is, uh, it's a fascinating saga because it begins with a family, and the family is, you know, the father says, Observe the Three Musketeers by Alexandre Dumas. One for all, all for one. That should be our watchword, and we have to live by that. And we have to cooperate, respect each other, listen to each other, and work hard. And they really did work hard. There were so many false starts between 1908 and 23 when they incorporated. April 4th, I guess it was. Um, And then they had false starts after that, too. They had uh, trouble just keeping afloat, you know, to pay John Barrymore's salary. Their first star was a dog, Rin Tin Tin. And then they had to, you know, find a human star. And that was John Barrymore, the most respected actor in America. And, you know, they offered him a lot of money. And he, he said, well, why not? Why not? And it was... Kind of a bad thing for him. He had just done Hamlet, redefined Hamlet for an entire generation, and he didn't go back to Broadway until the late 30s, essentially doing spoofs of his own life, not doing anything, but, you know, not doing o- O'Neill or Shakespeare, uh, doing just junk, and, and he was doing junk in the movies too. Is this, you know, he did, did some great films for Warner's in the silent era that I recommend very highly. In particular, When a Man Loves, The Sea Beast, although it's hard to see, but it's a very, very powerful film. Um, And Don Juan is fantastic. It's really, really a very entertaining film. Now his sound films at Warner's didn't do quite as well and weren't quite as distinguished. One of the best is Sven Gali, and there's also The Mad Genius, which uh, Michael Curtiz directed. But John Barrymore's great sound films were at MGM and Columbia, oddly, not uh, not Warner's, which had, you know, made him a movie star. Because, you know, it's not guaranteed you're going to make a stage star into a movie star. Look at Alfred Lund, Lynn Fontaine, and I could name a dozen others. But, uh, no, the, the Warners had a rough time for a long time. But once they let their brother Sam follow his dream of sound movies, talking movies, that everything changed for them. They went from the, the bottom of the pack. Well, they weren't even part of the big eight of the, of the majors. And then they were, then they, their income in 1929 uh, was way ahead of MGM and Paramount, which was considerable. So uh, it really changed everything for them. But they were smart and they were gamblers and when the sound films with Technicolor, the two color Technicolor, not two strip, there's no such thing. There's three strip and there's two color. Anyway, they were doing all these musicals and they were pretty much just showing a proscenium art, people moving around and dancing and singing. 
and people got the audiences got bored bored with it so they moved to something else and that was the crime films torn from the headlines so the first one was Little Caesar which introduced stage star Edward G. Robinson the next was The Public Enemy which introduced a stage actor not a star James Cagney and boy <laughs> they shrunk gold <laughs> Of course, then that's created a cycle, which the Studio Relations Committee, which is part of the Hayes office of the MPPDA, uh, they said, well, look, at this is really causing problems. <laughs> we can't have these movies. So they put, they put the kibosh on gangster films. So what Warner Bros. did was made crime detection movies about the FBI, and the G-men, and so they got the, you know, still got the, had to use their machine guns, and but it wasn't uh, glorifying criminals as they had been accused of before. What I think is so interesting is I don't think in today's world, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, we have actors that are remotely as unique and visually interesting as Edward G. Robinson or James Cagney or Bogart. I mean, they weren't conventionally maybe beautiful, but they were so compelling. Like you just can't take your eyes off of them when you watch them. This is what was said in 1931 after the Little Caesar came out. A number of the critics said, this man is kind of strange looking. What is the, the appeal that would cause people to break the doors at the theater? Then it was the second or third day. People broke the glass. They were pushing, the crowd was so large, was pushing and broke the glass on the doors. What, is this man, what does this man have that people want to look at? But, uh, you know, the, his, his soul came through to the movie camera. He was a unique individual, you know, an art collector and a very, oh, yeah. very gentle, gentle, kind person. Uh, they don't make faces like that anymore, is, no, is to paraphrase no. Gloria Swanson in Sunset Boulevard. Yeah, and look, look at her. She wasn't conventionally beautiful, but you, you couldn't stop looking at her. Yeah, there was just something about it. And there, Peter Lorre, there's another one that was so... Mm -hmm compelling like you can't not watch them and be fascinated by what's going on in their mind and uh, one of the things that, that the Warner Brothers had going for them from the from 23 they hired these young guys one was a uh, publicist that was Hal Wallace and one was a, a novelist Daryl Zanuck and they said you know do what we say, but then you come up with ideas, we'll use them. Well, they <laughs> they defined the Warner Brothers style, and they you know they both became exemplary producers, uh, really imaginative. Uh, Zanuck was considered a story editor, uh, second only to Irving Thalberg, who was the arbiter of, of uh, film stories mm -hmm. for fifteen years. But Zanuck was great. He he really could look at a script or look at this the rushes or at a rough cut and put his finger on what didn't work. And either, why? Either to take it out or and, and what to put in its place. And it was, you know, it's a very, very important thing. And then, of course, not only did Warner Brothers innovate with sound, as we know, but also I think the Busby Berkeley musicals also alongside the gangster cycle because those musicals, I don't know about anyone watching, but... They've really kind of comforted me during the pandemic. I repeatedly watched tons of Busby Berkeley musicals because there was something so reassuring about them. You've got the, the scrappy showgirl who maybe the show gets canceled and then the show happens and then the show's a hit and she finds love and everything ends well, even if you know in the real world it's not like that. In the movies it is. And those comforted the heck out of me in 2020, 2021. And I can only imagine they probably comforted a lot of people during the Great Depression. Yeah, the first ones, yeah, took place. And you see in the film, they're, they're, they're all struggling to make ends meet. Yeah, it, was, um, it didn't pull any punches about the brutality of the Depression. Yeah, and what's, what's important, too, is a the, the couple of things. Uh, the failure of that first cycle of musicals that was very profitable at first taught them something this is a movie it's not a stage show it's not a radio show it's a movie it has to move mm -hmm. and Busby Berkeley really distilled these images and this, these, these 
designs and the choreography into pure cinema. So, you know, you have a movie going along with characters and everything. When you go to those musical numbers, you're seeing pure cinema. Oh, yeah. And it's, it's uh, you know, very important. And there's no way those could have actually been done on the stage, but it doesn't matter because right, they're yeah. so cinematic, you just don't care. Yeah, that's true. And then the other thing is a uh, uh, number of writers have pointed out that uh, Remember My Forgotten Man, a musical number in Gold Diggers of 1933. Yes. Really takes society to task for letting the veterans of World War I be homeless, mm -hmm. s hungry, suffering, disenfranchised. It really, really got into that, that whole issue. It really pointed a finger. Yes, it's a powerful number. I, I saw it once at the UCLA archive on a giant screen and just seeing it on a big screen, that was absolutely so powerful. Yeah, it's pure, pure cinema. It just, it, it, the, the, you know, the cuts, the movement, the sounds, the light and dark, it, it really, they, they touch you. They make you feel. Yes. They make you think too, of course, about the, the issue, but, but you feel, you feel for those people marching in the, in the rain. Definitely. And I think Warner Brothers continue to churn out terrific movies for so many years. I mean, a hundred years of filmmaking. They have really not had a period where they went into, that I know of, that went into massive decline. Like some of the studios where their quality would get so low that they just eventually... Well, look at RKO. Closed in 56. Uh, yeah. UA closed in 81 after the Heaven's Gate crash. Mm -hmm. uh, MGM... Has not is not the same MGM that it was before. Uh, it, it really went through changes. Um, you know, lost its lot. Yeah. Yeah. So to have this company go a hundred years and uh, still have a recognizable product is you know it, so you know where it was uh, Little Caesar and then it became Batman and Superman and Aquaman. I, I'm very impressed, I have to tell you, <laughs> that this Aquaman grossed a billion dollars. I mean, how? I mean, you've got to give credit to Jason Momoa for being, you know, also a Pacific Islander movie star. Who, who, who thought that would happen? It's, 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 in, it's unlikely. It's really something. But uh, because, you know, John Hall was part Polynesian. But he wasn't, you know, a superstar like Jason Momoa is. So this is a brave new world. Well, I think unconventional movie stars, I would argue, are kind of Warner Brothers stock and trade to a lot of degree. Yeah, that's true. But I yeah. mean, so it kind of makes sense in a way that he would be a star, considering they had Edward G. and yeah, yeah. Peter Lorre and Betty Davis. I love Betty Davis, but again, not the what you would think of as a conventional, you know, maybe movie star at the outset. Anyway. Yeah, that's true. So, I mean, she could look gorgeous, yes. but in many films she chose not to because it was the character required it. Definitely. So out of all the Warner Brothers films, what would be some of, like if you had to name like your top five personal favorites, what would those be? The ones I've seen most often or projected most often in my, in, from my projection booth here, um, Beyond the Forest. <laughs> When I met King Vidor in 1975 at the Selznick Tribute, I said, oh, can I get your autograph? And he said, well, you, you know my film? I said, yes, I just, in the last couple of years, I've seen Beyond the Forest nine times. He said, why? <laughs> <laughs> you showed me that once here in your studio in downtown. I'll never forget it. And it's never been on DVD, right? Like ever? There's a rights problem. There's a certain kind mm, of... Oh, there's a song in it, right? The song Chicago. Isn't that's what that I the thought. rights issue? Turns out that's not the issue. Yeah. It's not the issue. It could okay. be, though, because uh, songs have stopped a lot of films from being cleared uh, for uh, broadcast or uh, uh, commercial release. No, it, it's... Um, they renewed it twice. The author is dead. There's no issue. Uh, no estate. Um so as far as I know, the reason was that they couldn't, if a film's been, re I think there's some kind of strange loophole, and this is applied, mm -hmm. there's about 100 films in this category. 
Oh gosh, I hate that. Yeah, George sure. Spelton's team told me. Um, and if you if they renew twice, then they can't get anyone to negotiate for the rights with, then they have to leave it in limbo. Because they, I don't know if it's because if somebody could come at them and cause all kinds of problems. That is a shame, because when you showed it to me, I joke about it, but it's not only does Betty chew the scenery, she takes the scenery, puts it in a blender, hits the puree button, and then throws the contents of the blender on the floor. Yeah. Like, that is what she does in that movie. Well, what surprised me when I saw it in the theater was that, you know, you had this movie that's supposed to be camp and, and over the top and outrageous and corny, blah, blah, blah. About two thirds of the way through, the laughter stopped. That people were really, what's going to happen to this woman, Rosa Moline? Is she going <laughs> to Rosa what's, Moline? What's going to happen to her now? I mean, she's really painted herself into a corner, and you know, sure enough, she dies at the end. Uh, but um, what other films are in that category? Um, at MGM, there's uh, Escapade. Christopher Bean, um, uh, Trial of Mary Dugan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a, a, a whole bunch of movies wow. from every studio. They're in that weird category where they just can't. Purgatory. <laughs> yeah, it's just a limbo, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. But, uh, but getting back to Warner Brothers, so, okay, so we've got Beyond the Forest. What are some of your other favorite Warner Brothers films? The Unsuspected, which is a uh, Michael Curtiz 1947 film, one of his films that he made under his own company and then released through Warner's. Uh, and it's a film noir starring Claude Rains as a radio broadcaster. So you know, people have said, oh, it's kind of a ripoff of Laura. Well, not exactly, but because um, uh, you, you know from the beginning that he's, he's murdering all these people and you're just wondering you know, who's going to catch him and but the two stars are Joan Caulfield, the two leads, I should say, and someone named Michael North. And obviously they were pushing them to become big stars. And you find yourself more interested in <laughs> Claude Rains, Audrey Totter, and Fred Clark. They just, they steal the show. And oh, Constance Bennett is very funny in it too. Very, very droll. Okay. So that film I recommend very highly. Again, it's, it's because it's like Curtiz. You've got the great uh, German ex expressionist uh, kind of uh, angles, lighting, uh, mood changes. It's very enjoyable. Okay. Uh, Female with Ruth Chatterton, directed by, once again, Michael Curtiz. Very Art Deco sets in that movie. Up yeah. and until up in the end, it's a feminist type film about right, a woman yeah. boss, which is great. Yeah. Okay, that's that's on a, in one of the blue uh, not Blu-ray DVD sets, uh, Forbidden Hollywood. I think. Mm -hmm. Okay, Mildred Pierce. That's also a favorite of mine. You know, it's close to being a perfect film. Yes. Uh, for you know, from so many aspects, it's just great. Uh, Humoresque, which was directed by Jean Negulesco, who came to Hollywood in the early '30s as a uh, scene designer, a production designer. He was storyboard scenes for them to film for transitions or whatever that the director of the film didn't feel like well, he didn't knew where to put the shots how to create the shots the sequence of shots and Negulesco would draw them and design them and then help them you know film them too so by this by the time he had, and he did shorts too everybody did shorts who wanted to become a director that was a training ground so then uh, he did the Mask of Demetrius, which is a very enjoyable mystery. And so Humoresque is, technically, it's, it's very impressive how they manage to match the music to the action and how the music helps to tell the story and how it's you know, a very unconventional love story. It's just, it's a very, very impressive film and perhaps uh, the greatest acting achievement of Joan Crawford. I love watching her and John Garfield together because they, they give every bit as good as they get with each other. Mm -hmm. And it's really like watching two just titans clashing horns or locking horns yeah. on screen. And I don't know how they got along off screen, but on screen they are electric. They well, really are. 
as a matter of fact, she just, she seduced him. Hmm. Good to know. <laughs> and uh, then she had parties for the for the cast. Uh, Oscar Levant and his wife went to the one of her dinners and said she was there with all these keys in her hand, jingling the keys like a jailer and ordering people around. And and then she sat down and, and she was just really something. She said she was drunk with glamour. <laughs> we should all be drunk with glamour, yeah. quite frankly. That's a great phrase. I like that. Okay, another film, Juarez, which is... Uh, Betty? William Dieter Lee, Betty mm -hmm. Davis, Brian Hearn. Uh, not to forget Paul Muni as Benito Juarez. Mm -hmm. And it's it's a really... It's like two movies in one. It's a, the, the, there's the Juarez story, and then there's the Carlotta and Maximilian story. And they don't really overlap. Uh, they never the characters never meet, but it's it's very satisfying. It's really I saw this at USC summer of seventy three, coming up on fifty years, a nitrate print, brought over from Burbank, a sepia tone print, and I tell you, <laughs> it it was just like three dimensions. It was really something. And likewise, when I saw at the American Cinematheque there was a private screening of Casablanca. Would that have been like seven or eight years ago? When that fanfare came on, mm -hmm. I tell you, that nitrate first generation soundtrack, boom! It was wow. It's the, this print is that old. It's that clean. It's that powerful. And every image just was crystal, crystal clear. And all the shades of gray and silver, it just was, you know, just all the roundness and the depth and everything. It's just wonderful. And that's how I saw Mildred Pierce at USC also in 73 and um, Flamingo Road. Because they were having, you know, Ben Burt, who got all the awards for the sound design for Lucasfilm. He and a couple other students put on a Michael Curtiz festival. Because it was this was the, the 50th anniversary of Warner's. So they got all these prints from Mortars, all the nitrate prints, uh, all except for Adventures of Robin Hood because two of the reels had decayed. So we had to see that in 16. But to see these films in the original prints was exceptional. And it's you know, a, a rare and unique experience because there's just no way to duplicate that. I mean, it's apples and oranges, digital and film. And I like, I like both. I really do like both. I, I like my, my Blu-rays a lot. I really do enjoy them. But I, I've got to see films too, you know. I, I've got to see that, that bulb shining through an emulsion. There's a, there's a unique quality to it. Definitely. And getting back to Idolapino, because we've kind of gotten a little off topic, but that's okay. That's okay. Uh, what are your favorite Idolapino films, either Doing oh, Warner Brothers no, that's, or non-Warner Brothers. <laughs> Just tell me about those and why you love them. Uh, Roadhouse. Yes, Richard it's Widmark, it's, right? It's, yeah, Jean, yes. it's in Jean Nigalesco again. Mm -hmm. Really brilliant director. He did Titanic also, How to Marry a Millionaire. He doesn't get mentioned enough. Yeah, I agree. He's, yeah. He's great. But uh, Roadhouse, it's also Cornell Wilde. And... She sings... Um, one for my baby and one more for the road? Yeah, she does a fantastic job of that. And uh, she, she plays a, a, you know, a multifaceted character as usual. And let's see what else. Um, the Hard Way, of course. Mm -hmm. And the um, Man I Love, that was with, with Alan... I mean, sorry. Robert Alda, it's not about Alan Alda, uh, his father. Uh, and there's one f uh, from Paramount from 39 called The Light That Failed, and it's Ronald Coleman, he's a painter, and she is jealous of his work, and she slashes his painting, and he's going blind, and he doesn't realize what has happened. It's just, oh, it's a very poignant film um, and she is good in, in Anything Goes also with Bing Crosby and, and uh, Charlie Ruggles I think Ida is one of those stars that she makes anything she's in better 
Mm -hmm. Like she elevates the quality of whatever it is she's in. The one that I'd like to see that I haven't seen is called One Rainy Afternoon. It was produced by Jesse Lasky and Mary Pickford in 1936. And Frances Lederer was the star and she was the leading lady. Um, but it's hard to see those those films that were released through UA. You just you know, who knows where that film is now, or where the, the where the preprint material is, or but I've never seen it. Um, and of course, the sixteen millimeter shrine. She's fantastic in that, and she's fantastic in the big night. Um, and again, an incredible director. You know, I, I discovered her work back when I was in college, and we didn't see a lot of female filmmakers when I was in film school. So it was a huge treat to see a woman as a director and a movie made from a woman's point of view. So I've always really valued her voice, her creativity, and her daring in uh, making the films she made. And there were two she did at RKO with Robert Ryan. Uh, Beware My Lovely, is that it? And... Uh, on dangerous ground. Oh yeah, that's a great one too. Yeah, that's a great one too. Yeah. All right. Well, I think that about wraps it up. We've had a really good talk here by Lipino and also about Warner Brothers and your book. So, for anyone who wants to buy this book, it is available at Larry Edmonds in Hollywood, which we always encourage supporting. You forgot to tell too. them what I did. <laughs> I didn't just write it. You wrote it. You no, did. No, no. There's something else I did. Every picture in this book. <laughs> passed through my computer and was improved by Photoshop. Uh, some a lot, some a little, but they all re-sparkle now because of the, the capabilities of digital photography to, to improve something. For example, uh, I got in the mail an eight by 10 color transparency, not a negative, a transparency. We, we looked at, through it and see the positive image. Uh, there was Betty Davis, Errol Flynn, but the thing is they're curled and there's little spots on them and sometimes the base had turned yellow or orange. Uh, and those had to be brought to, you know, look like they just had been shot. And so behind us on the wall is one of them. And the very magnanimous and generous Lou Valentino, who's a, a gentleman in back east, made it possible for us to have, for example, this one from uh, The Man I Love. And that was a Kodachrome transparency from that year that had to be scanned, color corrected, cleaned up, and then the contrast enhanced. So, but I want people to understand that. It's not to give praise to me, it's to say, here's something that you can enjoy in a way that people even in, in those days would not have been able to see that that quality of color. Because in, in those days, it was rotogravure in the magazines, and the colors looked like they, had, you know, somebody had sprinkled flour on them or something. They had kind of a, a dusty... Mur Milky. Yeah, yeah. But here, you'll see that the real colors that the camera saw that day, that it took the picture. All right. And, and, nothing, and, and nothing like seeing Errol Flynn and Betty Davis in color. <laughs> That is right. You were right about that. And by the way, if you love film history, I'm sure you probably know about Mark Vieira and his incredible work on Irving Thalberg, Pre-Code, Film Noir, George Harrell. I could keep going and going and going. I have a whole section of your books in my show, like a whole Mark Vieira dedicated section. Oh, thank you. I do. And you've got more coming up. Do you want to plug any future books that you're working on, or is that kind of on the... No, it's fine. Um, I was able to help uh, Jeremy Arnold with his book, Christmas at the Movies, Volume 2, which will be coming out in December. And um, uh, Forbidden Cocktails, which is Andre Darlington, that'll be coming out, I guess, in the spring. And that's a book about uh, how to mix cocktails and then watch a pre-code movie. So I wrote the foreword for that and also did the photography work. And uh, last but not least... Uh, my book from 2013, George Harrell's Hollywood, which is about the man who was in the Granada buildings from 1928 to 30, and then became the biggest 
photographer in Hollywood, the most famous, the most well compensated. Uh, anyway, uh, my book about him is coming out in a revised version. 50% new images, 100% upgraded in Photoshop, and it's in a, a more this size as opposed to the 9 by 12 as before. So it'll be more affordable and easier to carry because the other one did cause uh, some hernias, I believe. <laughs> so anyway, the point is knowledge has taken me all these years to gain must be shared. So I'm happy. Well, Mark, this has been a great discussion and thank you so much. I think we should toast to Ida with what's left of our living yeah. news. So to Ida Lupino and to Warner Brothers. All right. And mm. please stay tuned for more food, fun, and film history from Hollywood Kitchen.